What is it that actually allows us ground dwelling humans to fly? And how do we create more lift when we need more lift? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the third class in the Principles of Flight series. Today we're looking at lift, the key force that allows us to fight gravity and fly through the skies. This class builds on the foundations laid in the previous class about airflow and aerodynamic forces. So a good understanding of that video will help greatly with this class. And by the end of the class, you should have a good understanding of the overall concept of lift and how to generate more of it when we require it. Lift is the vertical component of our resultant force that we saw in the previous class. Lift acts in direct opposition to the weight of the aircraft. The amount of lift that we get is dependent on the dynamic pressure. Because we know that static pressure plus dynamic pressure is always a constant, we know that if we increase the speed, we reduce the static pressure, which means that our pressure differential is greater and therefore there's a larger resultant force. This is what we covered in the previous class. So we can say for sure that our lift varies with our dynamic pressure or our lift varies with a half rho v squared. The lift force is also dependent on the area of our wing. The thing that generates the reaction force is actually the pressure differential. And pressure equals force times area. So if we multiply this pressure by the area, we come up with a force. And that is what we're actually looking for. The final property that influences the amount of lift that something can create is something known as the coefficient of lift. or CL. This is a measure of the ratio of surface pressure to dynamic pressure and it varies at different angles of attack and different wing designs. The easiest way to think of it is just how well an aircraft design itself is at creating a lift for that angle of attack. If we combine all of these factors together, we can come up with an equation for lift, which is the lift equals, we know it varies directly with the dynamic pressure. So the dynamic pressure, a half rho v squared. The area, because we know we have to multiply by the area to get this force. Area, we don't use A, we use S for surface area. And then we also multiply by this coefficient of lift to get our lift formula lift equals a half rho v squared s c l. This lift equation can be used to answer some very simple questions, such as this. Calculate the lift generated by the following conditions. Area 150 meters squared, speed 130 knots, air density 0.25 kilograms per meter cubed, and a coefficient lift of 0.95. So again, it's very simple. Lift equals a half rho v squared s c l. The only thing of importance to really note about this equation is that it uses SI units, meaning that we have to convert things back to the fundamental units used in the physics calculations, meters, seconds, kilograms, newtons, or combinations thereof. In this equation, the only one that needs converting out of these is the speed. So let's deal with that first. So a speed of 130 knots is 130 nautical miles an hour. So if we want to find out what it is per minute, we would divide by 60, and then for every second we would divide by another 60, which would give us speed of 0.03611111 nautical miles every second because we've divided by 60 and then divided by 60 again to get the seconds okay so how many feet 
are in an optical mile, we know that they are 60, 76, 60, 76 feet in a nautical mile. So we then multiply here by 60, 76, and we'll get feet per second. Which gives an answer of 219.4111 feet every second. Okay, we're getting closer, but we need to find it in meters per second. How many feet are in a meter? 3.28 feet in a meter. Meters are longer, so there's going to be fewer of them in this distance. So the speed would equal 219.401 divided by 3.28, which gives us an answer of 66.4. 894 meters covered every second. If you've been calculating this along on your calculators, there might be some rounding differences and uh, you might have used some slightly different numbers for these conversions. But for the sake of argument, we're just gonna round it to a nice whole 67 meters per second. Okay, so that's conversion done. Now we just plug everything in. So a half times the density rho 0 0.225 times the speed squared, worked that out before, 67 squared times the area 150 times 0 0.95. If you plug that all into calculator, you should come out with an answer close to 719.64.3. Newtons, which is enough to lift about 7,300 kgs of mass. Now let's look closer at the coefficient of lift. As I said before, it's dependent on the wing design and the angle of attack. The angle of attack is the line between the relative airflow and the cord of the aerofoil. So you've got your aerofoil like this, with the cord, nose to tail, leading edge to trailing edge. You have your relative airflow coming in here. This angle here is your alpha, sometimes given the symbol, or your angle of attack. This diagram, we're basically looking only at the effect of angle of attack. So we're assuming a completely symmetrical aerofoil like this. So as you can see, the amount of coefficient of lift, the amount of lift that this design produces, increases steadily up to this point here. This would be considered our CL max for this design. And then it starts to rapidly decrease and eventually no lift is produced at all. This is where separation starts to happen and this is where there's too much separation and the wing is no longer creating any lift. So this point here will always occur at this angle. No matter how fast you're going or any other um, variables, for this wing design, it stalls at roughly 25 degrees angle of attack. Another influencer over the coefficient of lift is the thickness to cord ratio. So over C ratio. This graph again assumes a symmetrical wing. These are supposed to be symmetrical. The only difference here is the thickness to cord ratio. They should have the same rough length of cord. The only difference is this thickness. The lower line here is this wing design here. It's a thinner wing. So we'll label this thin, we'll label this one thick. As you can see, a thicker wing tends to produce a higher coefficient of lift. These points he here again are CL max. So a thick wing overall produces more of a coefficient of lift than a thin wing. Another point to note is that the stall angle also increases. 
So not only does it go higher, but it actually finishes later. So it stalls at a higher angle and produces more lift. So thick wings are good. Another big influencer over the coefficient of lift is the camber of a wing. So the camber of the wing is the measure of that curve that appears on the top of the wing. And as you can see, this is the cambered wing up the top. And this is the non cambered down below. So this should be representative of that very first graph that we saw. It's just a steady increase in angle of attack until we reach our CL max. Then it decreases and eventually stalls. The interesting thing about cambered wing is it essentially pushes that whole graph up. So the cambered nature will accelerate the air more than a symmetrical one, which is the reason for this higher CL max. You get higher dynamic pressure, lower static pressure, larger pressure differential, bigger reactive force. It also has the added bonus that it can create lift even when at zero angles of attack. This means that the wing can start creating lift before the aircraft is rotated up. So let's apply this situation and what we know now to a real world example, the takeoff. Good starting point for a lot of questions in the principles of flight. If they mention lift, write down the lift equation. And a good knowledge of the CL, the coefficient of lift graphs, for thickness chord ratio, camber and angle of attack will also help. So we can see lift equals a half rho V squared SCL. We need a lot of lift force for takeoff. So we're trying to maximize our lift because at takeoff, we're at the heaviest weight we can possibly be for the whole flight. We're full of passengers, cargo, fuel, and we only burn fuel and become lighter during the flight. In this lift equation, we can have an influence over three items. The dynamic pressure, the area, and the coefficient of lift. The easiest to understand is if we increase the speed our dynamic pressure increases, static pressure reduces, pressure differential increases, and the resultant force increases. So first things first, let's travel really fast, which is why when you're taking off, you travel down the runway really, really fast. We could also be assisted with having a larger area of wing. So let's increase the area. And what's the way to do that? Well, most modern jet wings have flaps that extend out and down out of the back of the trailing edge. It typically looks something like this. This would be the flaps in situation. So you can see the actual flap is housed inside the aerofoil itself and then it will run along tracks and extend out and down and what that does is that has the effect if you look at a top-down sort of view this should be the situation with the flaps in and then with the flaps out you get this tiny little bit of extra area over the wing so by extending the flaps if the flaps are out our area would go up. The last thing to influence is our coefficient of lift. We send that up and this whole thing will go up. How do we increase this coefficient of lift then? Well, we looked at the three things earlier. We looked at camber, thickness chord ratio, and angle of attack. The first thing we're gonna look at with the effect of flaps is the thickness to chord ratio. So when we extend these flaps, out and down, we actually increase the cord length, the cord length going from the trailing edge, sorry, the leading edge to the trailing edge. So what we've done by extending flaps is actually negative in terms of our thickness and cord ratio. because so our cord value goes up, whilst our thickness stays the same, we're dividing by a larger number, that means our thickness cord ratio goes down. So we start moving down 
um, instead of having something like this, pre-flaps. When we have the flaps out, we're closer to something like this. So by extending flaps, it's not actually very useful in terms of our thickness cord ratio, but we do get the benefit of increasing our camber of our wing. So this would increase our overall average curviness of that top surface, which as we looked at the graphs before, we know pushes up this graph. So we're gonna extend flaps and reduce it down to this sort of shape, and then we're gonna push it up and overall, with the benefit of that extended area, flaps are seen as a very positive thing for takeoff. The next thing to do is just to increase this angle of attack, which is why when you take off, you come down and you rotate. You're artificially increasing that angle of attack, that angle between the cord line and the relative airflow. So for the coefficient of lift to increase, we increase our angle of attack by rotating. We increase our camber by putting the flaps out, but we actually reduce our thickness cord ratio by doing that. So by extending flaps for takeoff, you have more area and more camber. The only thing that goes down is our thickness to cord ratio, but it's two for one exchange so this is why flaps are a good thing for takeoff. To summarize, lift is the vertical component that directly opposes the weight of the aircraft. The equation is lift equals a half rho v squared, s for surface area, cl for coefficient of lift, which is a measure of how good the wing design itself is at producing the lift. The coefficient of lift is dependent on three things the angle of attack, the thickness, and the camber. Angle of attack, as we see along this bottom axis here, increases up until a point in which it suddenly drops off. That drop-off point, that stalling angle of attack, will be the same for the wing design at all speeds, disregarding all external factors. As we increase the thickness, we increase our CL max. Um, if we reduce the thickness, we make it more thin, our CL max reduces. By increasing the camber, we move this graph up and it's possible to create a coefficient of lift even at zero angle of attack.